Rick Drost is a singer-songwriter from the Boston area who grew up in a family that was very focused on sharing music together. Rick told me that in his family, his mother and his sisters would gather with him and sing around the house, in the kitchen, in the car, in church, and that his mother uh, influenced the children to sing in church choir, and that resonated with him. And that his father didn't sing, but he played the piano and inspired his own playing of piano. Uh, his father would play for a relaxation each night, when, and that would be when the children were falling asleep, the last thing they would hear. And Rick also added, in his early roots of finding poetry and music, He's not sure how it happened, but he started memorizing and reciting poetry when he was in high school. He also had an interest for math and in computer work. And so he went on to study mathematics at Yale and then Brown University, and also to teach mathematics and computer at Brandeis and Harvard. But he kept music close to him in those years in different ways. Uh, he continued singing with a chorus, and he uh, participated in a band akin to the Kingston Trio, who traveled about. Um, and he ditched his piano for a banjo for a while, and Rick noted that he thought it might help him to get the girls interested. <laughs> um, and then when he heard Leonard Cohen, he started in 1967, he said, I, I thought I'd like to learn to play songs like that. And then he first heard Joni Mitchell in New Haven. And he said that was when it hit him, the desire to try to write and sing songs, it crystallized in him at that time. So he started writing and singing in coffee houses in DC in New England in the 70s, and finally settled into Cambridge, where he started playing with a folk rock group, Parts and Labor. And in the 1990s, Rick took up choral singing and joined the Spectrum Singers and toured in Russia, the UK, South America, uh, with uh, the group called the Yale Alumni Chorus. Rick notes that he has always appreciated, benefited, learned from his mentors in songwriting and music and has attended a number of workshops that have been very meaningful to him at Passim and in Cambridge. And uh, these helped him to start writing again after a bit of a hiatus. And so he began writing his own songs and participating in Parts and Labor once again, who regrouped and formed a CD. And he noted that rediscovering songwriting with the help of a live music community helped him to find that living uh, with music, making music was its own reward to him. And he goes on making music, performing at least once a week, wherever he goes. And he has enjoyed some time in instruction with great instructors such as David Wilcox and Vance Gilbert, and recently had the opportunity to perform on the stage at Rocky Mountain Song School in front of his mentor, Vance Gilbert, which was a delight to him. And when I asked Rick, finally, why he thought we need to share the art of poetry, story, and song, he said, why, why we need to share, it's about affirming connection. Any song will connect with a few people, maybe a very few. And different songs click with different people at different times. But hearing or even feeling that someone out there is thinking, oh, I get that. I feel that way too sometimes or as a listener saying, he feels that way too, really helps us feel more a part of the world, more grounded, more secure. So a great quote by Rick Drost, and I'm happy to introduce him to come up and share some of his songs with us this morning. Please give him a warm welcome. Rick Drost. Spring and fall, you heard mainly Hopkins.
Margaret, are you grieving over Golden Grove on Levy? Leaves like things of man you with your fresh thoughts care for. Can you? As your heart grows older, you will come to such sights colder by and by. Nor spare a sigh the words of one. Cambridge and the Boston Globe uh, comes out with an article on the weekend about uh, the swans in the public garden. Now, I had read and loved a bunch of Shakespeare. The swans are known as Romeo and Juliet, and the public garden is this magnificent green space uh, that uh, I'd had some occasion to go to, but uh, the article on the swans pointed out that uh, although they're known as Romeo and Juliet, they're actually two females. <laughs> and uh, they uh, trade off on the normal gender-related roles of uh, nest building and scaring intruders away. Swans as a species do that, apparently. I thought that was great wisdom, so I went down to meet the swans and, and, and fell, fell in love with them. Uh, they uh, uh, dance mirroring each other, they swim mirroring each other, uh, and uh, I went down there morning, noon, and night, and I wrote a valentine to them, uh, and this is it. Sunrise gleams on Park Street spires, warblers wake and we arise. Good morrow, cuz we hear them here below. Bleacher fans and Brahmins know we're Juliet and Romeo, two 
swans on garden bound I'll turn and slow We're christened lovebirds, best of breed They placed us in a willowed Eden Snowy white on emerald green The gliding graceful dancerine Inspiring love in all who've seen us At our silent minuet Though there's no Romeo between us Both of us are Juliet Tied wine, breast to breast Each double twice our waves caress us Ask and listen, curtsy, bow, bow, the last may curtsy now. As changes ring on carol on at noon, they bring the swan boats round. Signets come from far and we to ride on back so tranquilly. Mayhap a flame-haired freckled lad Gives our thoughts voice and asks his dead Which swan would be Romeo Who Juliet would be Who will build our nest today If I warm the eggs we lay Sundown Newbury as evening light Guilds cathedral elms up from below Brownstone red brick vertebrae facades Will nod and wink as we're now mirrored in vermilion Turn and slow a curve, a third heart trace, with wings unclipped by love will fly, circling stars in sapphire sky will glide, and decide, which swan would be Thanks much. Well, high art. This song is not poetry. You'll have to decide. But it's another Boston song. A couple of years ago, an article came out in the uh, Globe, another Globe article, that uh, Whole Foods was banning the sale of live lobsters. Uh, on account of it was unfair to the lobsters. They couldn't figure out how to kill them well enough, and they couldn't keep them in captivity well enough, 
in such a way that each creature could reach its full potential. Well, the chefs thought it was a big publicity stunt. I got interested in the moral dilemma posed by what they were going to do with the leftover lobsters that they couldn't sell. Live next, right, right next to a big Whole Foods, got friendly with a cashier, asked her, uh, happy to say they did the right thing by all those lobsters. She took me back into the back of the store, showed me proudly. There's 48 lobsters still living, still living in the Whole Foods in Cambridge, and, <laughs> and this is their story. Way down back of the good food store, they built us out an ocean floor. Very lucky lobsters love to lure. Feed us scraps of hard salami, chevre olives and edamame. Each day we're on another kind of roll. Pilgrims thought we were fertilizer, later gourmets learned to prize our springy, sweet white flesh, dry brushed with tangerine and salmon. To sell us from captivity is wrong, they say, but secretly we think our great good fortune might have more to do with mammon. And would they grill us? No, no, no. And they couldn't just kill us now. <laughs> they couldn't just kill us. What would they tell? The tofu swells and the friends of free range buffalo. Pa got sold before our day at a dandy dinner in Old Back Bay. Mid nutmeg, cream, and brandy gladly met his destiny. Now he shells out west some 40 miles, the rest of him has cleared Deer Island. He's back in the harbor, singing near my cod to thee. And would they sell us? No, no, no. Or braise and gel us? No, they'll have to treat us well. Or we'll cast a spell and we'll tone their radicchio. Meanwhile, my life's like no other. I play mahjong with my twin brother. We dance the quad, we'll sing our song to quarter after three. Till morning, then we fall asleep on cobble in a happy heap. Some jellyfish are nightlight if we ever have to pee. Old friends arrive from stores everywhere in the sacks of rock we next day well down in chapel hill y'all is picked up a gentle draw little from lincoln park is always singing twist and shout and lincoln's back from camden town his flight's so long he almost drowned and lee from thousand oaks is like now what's this all about and would they poach us too slow now they're gonna coach us with yoga classes, meditation, ten-step meetings. Each crustacean will be all the lobster he or she can be. Well, lobster rhymed with dinner bell. For years at sea, we've known this well. We thought our last swim would be in a big blue speckled pot. So every day, the chosen many we gather round, phase our antennae with a lobster podcast live at noon. Give thanks for what we got. We're singing. Home, home, our dear rain, where the shrimp and the seahorses play. Have you seen my wife, Davy Jones? And my favorite. Swimmer at 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 in a watery cave somewhere I'll shed my shell and he'll come there. Oh
Lobster rag. Well, well, this next song is my most recent uh, one I can do out and uh, finished it last May. I had occasion to uh, reread T.S. Eliot's uh, Four Quartets last, last fall, and the first one of them, Bert Norton, has a line in it, at the still point, there the dance is, that uh, uh, really caught me. And I realized I'd heard a lot of still points, <laughs> about a lot of still points in literature, movies, that uh, it turns out it's a very influential poem. So I read it and reread it, it uh, and uh, wrote this song as a kind of a, uh, as a kind of a, um, mm, well, a prayer for meditation. <laughs> Apple tree, 
the family Raised in the home that they built in its place You ride to the strains of a loopy calliope Reaching for brass rings they no longer make Finding apple trees everywhere now. Forest in new fallen snow. Gull above beach cliff towers in Tuscany. And pear, apricot, then there. 